Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from Facebook, Katherine Schmidtka. Hello, everybody. It's my very great pleasure to introduce Peter Winzer from Nokia Bell Labs. He's going to be presenting about some of the key innovations at Bell Labs. And then afterwards, I have the opportunity to sit down with him, and he's going to share some of the effects that this innovation has had on the industry. So please join me in welcoming Peter Winzer. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks, Catherine, for your kind introduction. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak here at this summit. Um, what I'm going to try to do in the next 10 minutes or so is give you an overview of how Bell Labs works. Bell Labs uh, has been around for uh, almost 100 years. And there is a lot of things that we can learn from the way Bell Labs has operated, especially regarding open innovation and open, uh, openness regarding industrial and academic borders. So there is one uh, very good example for the spirit of Bell Labs, and that's reflected on the slide you see here. That shows the famous horn antenna of Crawford Hill, which was built uh, in 1960 to support the very first telecommunication satellite experiments. Satellites were invented by Bell Labs, the telecommunication satellites, and first launched to, um, to do communications by Bell Labs back then. And in order to do so, to do the communications from ground to satellite to ground, uh, relay communications, they had to build uh, big horn antennas on the ground. Um, and then they also used them not just for satellite research, but also to uh, look beyond. So they saw, for example, that there was cosmic background radiation coming, microwave background radiation, and they couldn't explain it. So scientists, uh, Bob Wilson and Arno Penzias, they very carefully uh, measured that background radiation, and they could only reconcile it with theory um, by looking at the Big Bang theory. And uh, the Big Bang theory back then was very heavily disputed, but with that uh, experiment that showed exactly how much background radiation there is from free space, they could prove that the Big Bang theory was correct. And from then on, we know what the origin of our universe is. So all of that coming out of a telecom project, which was called satellite communications. And that really captures what Bell Labs is all about. Think beyond. So to understand that even better, let's go 100 years back. Let's look back um, when the telephone system wasn't existing. The telephone had been invented, but there was no network. There were no switches, no cables, no nothing. Everything had to be invented from scratch in order to deploy a massive uh, nationwide network. And Bell Labs was the research arm back then already for uh, AT&T and Western Electric to do the research that was necessary to invent all these little building blocks that make up a telephone network and later the internet. And Bell Labs always took the stance that it is important to extend general scientific knowledge because that will lead to many things unexpected that will create other industries. And um, in fact, that's what's happened. So you see here some of the milestones uh, that Bell Labs achieved while doing telecommunications research as its main focus. It had eight Nobel Prizes come out of this work, um, from electron diffraction to cosmic background radiation to the transistor, of course, the CCD, but then also other things that did not get a Nobel Prize bar, but are at least as important, like uh, the Unix or the C language, all coming out of Bell Labs research. In optics, the erbium dot amplifier, or uh, in wireless, the multi-antenna MIMO systems. Let me just talk about the transistor a little bit. So the transistor was a very much planned invention. Back then in the 30s and even 40s, telephone systems worked by means of vacuum tube amplifiers. You see them to the very left. So those things were extremely power hungry, very unreliable, very fragile. And uh, AT&T was looking for a replacement for those that would be low power and uh, very robust. 
So in order to do so, they looked into solid state physics. And solid state semiconductor physics did not exist back then. So they had to invent the entire field of semiconductor physics. So that's very much a forward-looking scientific approach. And by 1947, uh, the first transistor was built. And that ushered in a totally new era, of course, as you all know. Ten years later, in 1956, one of the three transistor inventors, Bill Shockley, he was from Palo Alto and his ailing mother lived there, so he moved back to Palo Alto and set up his own shop to uh, build silicon transistors. And that, in fact, is the very start of Silicon Valley. So Silicon Valley is a spin-out of Bell Labs, if you want. <laughs> and that's all summarized uh, in a very nice book. This one, The Idea Factory, which I really encourage you to buy. I have the Kindle version and the paper version, but I like the paper version much better. Uh, that's just me. Um, so I encourage you to, uh, to read that book where all these nice stories are in there. So going back, uh, going f forward a little bit in, in time to more uh, recent examples of Bell Labs innovation, let's look at the early 2000s. In the early 2000s, uh, 10G was really the currency of uh, communications. There were, everything was 10G, maybe a little bit of 40G was around. And in 2005, Bell Labs had the very first 100G transmission experiment that we did in, in the labs. And two years later, together with Verizon, we demonstrated 100G technology in the field on a live link in Florida for the very first time. Why is that so important? That's important because it shows that, 10, that 100G technology could work on an existing network that was designed for 10G and maybe 40G. So that upgradability was the real proof that 100G has a future and can go forward. And indeed, in 2010, um, Bell Labs enabled Alcatel-Lucent back then to come out with the first 100G coherent product. That's this chip here, little chip that does all the digital signal processing that's necessary for 100G. Uh, transmission. And uh, with that chip, we had a two-year market lead compared to any other competition. And all of you know that two years is an eternity in high tech. So that just shows how forward-looking research can really help you in the marketplace as well. But obviously, we didn't stop there. Last year, we demonstrated the first terabit per second transmission over a single carrier channel. So that's not super channels or anything. That's one laser a terabit per second in the lab. Now, why is that important? Because traffic is continuing to grow. And this little table here just shows you how much growth you should expect. So the table answers the question, how long does it take for a 10x or 100x increase in demand if you have a certain yearly uh, demand growth? For example, take 40%. If you have 40% uh, per year growth, it means that in seven years, you will need 10 times the amount of capacity or interface rate that you have today. And 100G was commercially available uh, in 2010, so we expect one terabit to have to be available in 2017 at a 40% growth rate. Now, all of you will have other growth rates in your networks, so you, you pick your favorite number, you pick your favorite years, but none of these years is far away. So that's why really 10x and 100x research is extremely, extremely important to get, uh, keep the industry going. So the next interesting thing is uh, capacity of fiber. It was always believed that fiber capacity is infinite. You can send as much with WDM, as much down the fiber as you like. But if you look at this chart, and I only want you to focus on the top curve, that shows how the capacity of WDM increased in the 90s by 100% a year. And then it slowed down around 2000. So at first, we attributed that to the telecom bubble and maybe to some lags in research. But as this trend continued, we, get, we got really worried. And if we get worried at Bell Labs, we go back to the very basics. So what we did is we dug out Shannon's old paper, you know, Shannon from the Shannon Limit, um, his 1948 famous paper, and extended it to the capacity of the fiber optic channel. And then if you plot that channel limit of the fiber optic channel uh, as a function of the transmission distance, and you plot the experiments and the products available with it, you see that there is only a gap of a few factors, like factor of two, three, four, or even five. But a factor of five is nothing if a factor of 10 means seven years. 
then a factor of five is nothing. So essentially, we are at the Shannon limit. And yes, fibers are therefore running out of capacity. And we are now asking, is there life beyond WDM? And again, in typical Bell Labs manner, we look very fundamentally at the physical dimensions that are available uh, to us. And with, with the help of frequency and space, hope to find solutions that allow you to scale your networks further. Thank you.